This is Unwind Your Mind Back to God, written by David Hofmeister and read by Tarana Singh. In today's episode, we continue the transfer of the dream with Book 3. In Chapter 2, this is Section 5, Opening to the Dreamer of the Dream Perspective, Part 1. Friend, what is the Holy Spirit's use for the past? David, it is symbolic. Words are the past. The teaching sessions are the Holy Spirit's use of the past. For example, as I bring up the events our friend described about his time in college, in order to point to something beyond it, That is the Holy Spirit's use of the past. Friend, I see. We are talking about the past right now and we think that is the present. I do not get that. But that is because I am deceived? David, it is the reference point. Picture it as a symbol. Here is the cosmos. The time-space cosmos. You perceive yourself as within the time-space cosmos. We will say in a galaxy, in a solar system, on a planet, call it Earth. On a continent, call it North America. In a state, within the city limits. In the upper room of a home, in a bedroom, sitting on a couch, in a body that is six feet tall. You are observing the time-space cosmos from that reference point which seems to be from behind two eyes and between two ears. It can seem as if the sense of self is perceived to be in the head. You perceive the cosmos from that specific reference point within the cosmos. But it seems to be possible to perceive the cosmos from a point that is not within the cosmos. You could say the dreamer of the dream is the mind that is watching all the images in the cosmos, including all the images that seemed to take place in history. Abraham Lincoln and Gandhi and Julius Caesar and Jesus Christ and Confucius and including all of the images that seem to be coming in the future. Friend, the dreamer is watching all that simultaneously. David, it does not matter what specific part of the cosmos is being seen. There is an awareness that they are all the same. If you have a giant structure that has all these different facets to it, as you turn it around, it does not matter what particular facet seems to be in front at any given moment so to speak. They all seen, they are all seen as the same. Friend, how do you get to that awareness from feeling like you are inside? How are you getting outside of it? David, realize first of all that you do not value judgment and you do not value ordering of thoughts. Everything we go into is about beginning to see that judgments, preferences and the ordering of thoughts are not valuable. Judgment is a device for maintaining the experience of being within the cosmos. The relinquishment of judgment is coming to the point of seeing that not only do I not have to give it up, but I never had it. I just have to realize that I cannot judge, that I am incapable of judging. Isn't that wonderful? That is the release point. It is not that you are giving up something that is real. You are not giving up something you had and are now losing. You never had it. You are incapable of judging. That is the point of perceiving it 
not from within the cosmos, but from the dreamer of the dream perspective. Friend, and is there a way to see that? I seem to enjoy chocolate ice cream with hot fudge on it. Is that a judgment? How do I look at that? I'm having a hard time because I do not want it to just be an idea. I do not want to play mind games. I want to understand how that is achieved, if it can be achieved. How do you adjust your mindset? David, you question the perception. The eye that perceives that it enjoys ice cream with fudge on it is a construct. Friend, so if I just start being more aware of all the judgments I make, it will undo itself? David, that is symbolic of unwinding yourself, of coming to clarity or discernment between what is real and what is unreal. This came up recently. Our friend was saying, But I like nature, just like you are saying about ice cream with fudge. I like nature, and I feel wrong because I like nature. Follow the metaphysics of this in and question the I that seems to like nature. Just question that I that seems to like the ice cream. Follow it in. I began questioning my roles, what I was doing and why I was doing it. I thought, well, I'm doing this because it's my, it is my job. Well, why do I have this job? I took the job because I need money. Why do I need money? I need money so I can have these things. Why do I need these things? Well, if you track it back down, if you keep tracing it down, you come to the belief in body identity. Friend, right. I feel like I have done all that with the job and the roles and the relationships with other bodies. I started to question all that because if there is no purpose, then I do not want to have anything to do with it. But if I do not have an experience of not being a body, I do not see how I can get beyond that, unless the experience will come by questioning. I guess that is what my question is. Do the questions bring on the experience? David, the questions are still coming from the ego, but the questioning of your beliefs and your thinking is meaningful in the seeming process of awakening. You desire an experience that will take the place of you as a body. And by your desire, that experience will be brought to you. It will seem to first come through miracles. The holy instant is the experience of being the holy son of God. Not the body, and not confined to this world in any way. Miracles will seem to precede that experience. You had one the other day, so to speak, when you came in and said, I was resting and for an instant I had this beautiful feeling of detachment, of total release, not worried about anything, not concerned. A miracle! That is a miracle. It felt great. It came to you by your desire for it. It is not like you have to go around collecting miracles. Your desire brings them to you. Your desire for the holy instant will bring it nearer to your awareness. That is why we say there is nothing you can do. Moving your eyes over the lines in a book is not going to bring you the holy instant. The desire and the intention of opening your mind to go beyond the words, to the meaning of the ideas, will bring the experience. The reflection of a person reading a book out on the screen is just a symbol. 
but the desire is in the core of your being. Friend. And that is what the questions are too? They are a symbol of that desire until I get past everything else? I guess asking the question is not causative. What is causative is the desire to ask the question? David. Let's look at time for a moment. If you believe with the ego that the past happened, you believe you are guilty in the past. And the present seems very minuscule. It seems to get covered over so easily. In that scenario, you believe that there is no power, no real opportunity for change in the present. The past is like solid granite. The present is like a teeny blip that is so easily covered over and the future is just a repetition of the past. Guilt. Guilt past. Guilt future. Fear past. Fear future. If you really believe that, why would you question at all? The belief in linear time inhibits questioning. If you do not believe there is hope of ever getting out of the pattern, you feel locked in. It feels like everything is set and determined. You are condemned to a life of sin, guilt, misery and upset. If you believe that, why would you even raise a question? The mind is closed and has concluded that life is hell. Friend, and there is no way out. David, like the bumper stri- sticker, life's a bitch and then you die. If that is your conclusion, then why question? The questioning comes in when there is a sense that there is more than what meets the eye. There is something more than all of this. The questioning comes in when the mind is not so convinced that it knows everything there is to know. Then the questioning begins inwardly. You begin to question more and more and more. You question the mind and the beliefs and the thoughts. Everything. One has to come to a point though where you reach the edge and leap off the cliff into certainty. There is no questioning in certainty. Christ is not a questioner. Questions are not inherently valuable. Christ asks no questions. Friend, I assume that I will know when I am at that cliff because I do not feel like I am there right now. I do not feel that I could just jump from this point that I am at. David, you do not feel it and you do not believe it. We are back to atonement or what seems not to be atonement. Friend, because I do not see how. I feel like I need to know how to do it. I do not see a doorway. I do not see the cliff. David, stay attentive. It is right there under your nose. In the parable of David, so to speak, I remember metaphorically being so drawn to these ideas. I was still having my doubts, but I sensed that there was something there. You sense that there is something, that there is a hope for emancipation, for happiness, peace and freedom. But it is not really anchored. It is more of a hope than an assuredness. Friend, From experiences I had on mushrooms, I can say I know that it is there. Even though it seems to have been years ago in linear time, the intensity with which I experienced that lets me know it is real. And the little experiences like the one I had the other day are letting me know it is real. But I feel like I am in a maze. I need direction how to get to the cliff so I can jump or how to get rid of the fear so I can jump. I want to not be afraid. I have always had an idea 
that God is gentle and he knows I am afraid. I always envisioned a process where the fear is slowly minimized to the point where the jumping is natural. David, that has been a helpful metaphor, but now the veils are starting to fall away on that one as well. Friend, I still had this sense even then that I had a choice. And now it is no different. I have to make a choice about whether I want to go for it. I did not feel strong enough at that time to let it be my reality. End of part one of section five of chapter two in book three. We will read the concluding part of chapter 2 of book 3 in tomorrow's episode.